one of the death scenes involves him controlling a bird and making it shit a bomb onto his car so that he blows up and dies. All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to episode nine of the Screenplay Archaeology Podcast. I'm your host, Kieran Head. And because it's the Christmas season and it's a little hard to schedule things around all that craziness, I am going to be flying solo again. And I'm bringing you a Christmas-themed script for this month, which is Batman 2, written by Sam Hamm, who was the writer, uh, or one of the writers of the 1989 Batman film from Tim Burton. And it's the first attempt at making a sequel to that movie, and it was eventually thrown out in favor of what became Batman Returns. But the storyline of the script is that it's the Christmas season in Gotham, and it's it's sometime after the end of the 89 movie. It's not really sure when, but it's not specific as to when. But basically, B- Batman is working with the police and tracking down criminals, and... Eh, <sighs> And Penguin and Catwoman, versions of those characters, they come to town, and they are hunting down the leading members of Gotham's five families, who are like the reading, the leading rich people in Gotham, and steal it, killing them, and then stealing these things called, that are referred to as Raven statuettes, which are part of a grander scheme by them, which I'll get into later. And to cover their tracks, they're... They're essentially leaving clues that are framing Batman for the crimes, and because he's not as closely associated with the police as he is in in the comics and other versions, it's really easy to um to assume that Batman is doing this. And then there's also these supposed street vigilantes who call themselves the Order of the Bat, who are really making him look bad and making it look like that he might actually be killing people, because they're kind of thuggish. And at the same time, we have Vicki Vale, the reporter from the first movie, who is still in a relationship with Bruce Wayne, and is now turned to investigating the play of the homeless in Gotham, and she runs across this young street vigilante who turns out to be Dick Grayson, whom they're setting up to be Robin, so you have that subplot. And that really is the overall arc of of the script. Now, to back back up a little bit, you know, to do what I always do, I'll talk about how I feel about the other parts of, you know, this series. And since since this is so t- directly tied into Batman 89 and Batman Returns, I'll just focus on those two, but I really do feel Batman 89, in as many ways as it has definitely aged, I, I feel that it is still, like, just a very good sort of superhero movie. It definitely sets sort of the template for movies to come, and also it led to a lot of imitators in the in the early to mid-90s, where everyone was trying to be this dark, moody superhero movie, in a sense, where you had, you had, you had, like, movies like The Shadow and The Crow that were very much following in its footsteps, and I just, it's just a movie that, even though I acknowledge that some of the later Batman movies are actually better movies, like, I maintain that, you know, the Nolan trilogy is, you know, the top, top tip of the mountain when it comes to Batman movies, at least at this point. Batman 89 is just a movie I can put on and just have a nice, relaxing watch with it. It's a movie I can put on just to have fun with, and I still enjoy it highly to this day. I think Michael Keaton brings a good brooding presence to Batman. I like how Batman, for a first movie, is kept largely in the background, and it's kept as a mysterious character that you find out about as the movie goes on. And I, I, and I think Keaton brings a lot to the role in terms of just darkness and menace and brooding. Um, Jack Nicholson as the Joker is amazing, to say the least. Like, he's fucking Jack Nicholson. When has the man not been awesome? You know what I mean? And he just says everything he says in that movie is memorable in one way or another. Like, never rub another man's rhubarb. Or, or the bit where he just shoots his own thug because fuck it, why not? <laughs> and he gets really pissed off because his because Batman steals his balloons. Like he's an incredibly fun character, and the movie is has an amazing amount of atmosphere to it. In the Anton first sets definitely bring that out in kind of a German expressionist kind of fashion, where the setting sort of brings out the mood of the piece instead of you know being a mood built up. Separate from the location, it's a mood that is that is absolutely reflected in what the place looks like. That's basically what expressionism was, and I find that that works incredibly well. And there's just all these interesting things to look at, like 
like you'll have a building that has like tubes coming out of it, and you have, you know, the Axis Chemicals building, which is just, it looks kind of like a boat a little bit. It, it, it's a really interesting design, and I like how Wayne Manor actually is a real building. And even though it is entirely constructed within a sound stage, they find ways to, you know, film it and and present it that it feels like a real city. Like, it doesn't quite have, you know, the bustle and the crowds of a real city, but they fill, they put enough people in the streets at any given time and film enough stuff around, to like, showing, like, construction sites and people in bars and such, that it feels like a living, breathing place, even if it is technically a dying city, according to the story. And I just think that's incredibly cool. I, I can't help but just fall in love with something like that that can build an artificial yet real feeling world like that. And, you know, there's just tons of fun ass sequences in it. Like you have bat like the whole the whole art museum sequence and and basically any time Batman appears, like his introduction in the movie is just amazing where you hear, you hear two you see the two muggers talking about him on the seal on the roof ceiling <laughs> on the roof of the building and you just see him descend in the background and he comes out and beats the crap out of them it's just, it's just so cool. it ends with the I'm Batman line which is which is really fucking awesome and, and there's there's that and you have I mean, like this, the art museum stuff which then which then leads into a pretty cool chase through the streets and Batman fights a guy with a sword, which according to John Peters, that's the reason why the movie made as much money as it is, because there's a guy who knows how to use swords in it. <laughs> and and just all sorts of things. And then you have little bits like where Bruce Wayne is at costume confronting the Joker. He's just like, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts, which is one of my favorite Michael Keaton moments ever. <laughs> and, and, you know, you have Michael Goff as Alfred, who is just a solid version of the character, you know. You know, he makes for just a fun... He, he's more of a warm, fatherly figure. He's less of, you know, the the sarcastic Alfred that you often get in the comics than we later got with Michael Caine. So you have that, and I just love all the little details you can notice. Like, there's a scene in the alley at the beginning where there's, like, there's like a Hebrew butcher shop in the background. It's like, why? I don't know, but it adds, it adds to the real feeling of it all. And, and the whole ending is just immensely entertaining with the Batwing coming down, and then the whole scene on top of the church and the ending shot of this movie batman 89 is just such that i can't help but just it sums up batman in such a perfect way where like you see where they introduce the bat signal and then like the camera pans up over the buildings and you see batman standing on the roof with the bat signal in the background and i'm like that is just such a perfect like way to just sum up the movie just in one single shot i love stuff like that and so it's interesting to see how they set that movie up. And there are things I don't like about it. Like, I'm not the hugest fan of Joker being the guy who killed Bruce Wayne's parents. Like, they don't play... A, 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 and <laughs> they don't play up the reasons behind it or anything too much, which is probably why it works okay for me. But I feel like it's one of those things where I don't like it, but it works perfectly fine within the context of the movie. And it, it makes for an interesting arc where, you know, he takes down the villain who created him. And when by, oh, and also by complete happenstance, he ends up creating an even bigger villain from the man who created him. There's some interesting things there. And also you have the ridiculous narrative convenience of Alfred just letting Vicky fail to the Batcave, which would be perfectly okay if they just had a scene where she goes to Wade Meander and she's like, Alfred, I know Bruce Wayne is Batman. Don't fucking bullshit me. And he's like, uh, uh oh shit. And, you know, Alfred, and Alfred really should have called up on Bruce's little rotary phone, because we see in Batman Returns, he has a little rotary phone in the Batcave. It's like, he could have called him up and said, um, sir, she knows. What the hell do you want me to do? <laughs> it's like Alfred, kind of, kind of falling down on the job there, Alfred. And, and there are a few things in the movie that don't make any sense. Like, you have, oh, hell, like the bit where, he find where where he finds out that you know Vicky got invited to the bat to him to the art museum by him and then Bruce is like wait I didn't do that and then it takes hours and hours for Batman to show up and rescue her from the Joker and it's like wait what took so long <laughs> and then you have the the guys on top of the church who had no way to get there <laughs> and, and stuff like that and but overall though it's it's just a really good entertaining film. And it, it's also a really important film because that was the huge major success that proved that you could make a comic book movie out of someone who wasn't Superman, an established American icon in his own right. 
So it is a very important film in that sense because we wouldn't have this huge wave of superhero films without that film. So yeah, we have so we have that. And then when it came time to make a sequel, I, I seem to be relatively alone in my thoughts on this movie. But Batman Returns is a movie which I have a really hard time getting along with that movie, and it's not. Uh, some of them are fanboy issues, and then there's other things about the movie that I just think don't work for me. Like, I, I can see why people like it, because it is a very moody, atmospheric film. I just don't like it when people try to pretend like it's deep, because I don't really think it's particularly deep. But for me, I feel like, as a, when they make it, for something that's supposed to be a sequel to the 89 movie, it feels so totally disconnected from it that it might as well have just been its own completely independent thing. And it's a movie which, for me, has way too much shit going on in it. You have all the crap that Christopher Walken is doing, and I fully admit Christopher Walken is the best part of the movie. He's just amazing. And because you have Christopher Walken's character is doing all this different shit. He has this evil plan of a power plant, which completely goes away in the movie. You never hear about it again. You have Catwoman and her thing, which is Revenge Against Christopher Walken. And then she forgets about that until the last ten minutes of the movie because we need to focus on Penguin shit. And then you have all the things with Penguin's going on and he ends up having like three different villain plots that all end up piling up on each other at the end. Which, that's actually partly the fault of Warner Brothers because they insisted, you know, more stuff be added to it because they felt the villain's plans weren't grand enough for a movie. And they actually suggested freezing the city and burning the city. So, yeah, you can see the seeds of Batman and Robin right there. And, yes, yeah, so you have all this shit that piles up on each other, and Batman's basically just kind of a passive observer who just kind of stumbles into it and stumbles out. And then you have shit like Batman just fucking brutal and just killing people. Like, it, 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 he kills a few people in the 89 movie, but it's in such a way that it's like you can see that he might not have had any other way out of that. But in Returns, he's just being like a malicious murderer, like setting dudes on fire, practically caving in one dude's skull, blowing a dude up and then dumping him on top of another guy. So he killed two guys right there. It's like, dude, dude, calm down. Stop fucking murdering people. <laughs> and yeah, and then on top of that, I find the tone of the movie is just really, really weird because it wants to be really dark and edgy in the sense that it begins with a kid just being thrown into a river and left to die. And part of the plot involves the murder of the firstborn, which is just a really dark place to go to anyways. <sighs> and then the movie also tries to be really, really cartoony in places like the Rocket Penguins and a number of other things, like the whole penguin running for mayor thing which is they stole from an episode of the old Adam West TV show. Uh, it, it, just kind of, it, it just kind of feels like it has two different tones clashing. Oops, I just hit the microphone. It has these two different tones clashing, and they don't really work for me because of that. And then there are things where I'm just like, where which are just the fanboy issues, like Catwoman isn't really Catwoman in the movie, Penguin isn't really Penguin. And they're kind of undercut as villains because the actual big bad guy of the movie really is Christopher Walken for a lot of it because he's the one who makes everything happen. And my god, Christopher Walken's wig is terrible. And then there's other issues I have with the movie. Like, I feel like the set design... You know, a Anton first wasn't around anymore at this point because he had committed suicide. And so it feels like whoever the set designer was was trying to do the Anton first set design, but it just comes off as Anton first light. So I don't really like it that much. It, 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 and they did, then they didn't do anywhere near as good of a job of making Gotham actually feel populated. It almost feels like a completely different city in Returns than it does in the 89 movie. And, and all that. And it doesn't help that Wayne Manor looks completely different. The Batcave looks completely different. And there's not really a heck of a lot of an excuse for this because all the sets were left standing in case they wanted to make a sequel. And then they just decided to use different sets, which I don't understand. So yeah, so yeah, that's my whole thing with Batman Returns. I think I'm being very fair to it in my assessment. I'm not being too angry and mean spirited like I like I can be. Like I can like I can go on rants and just be like, fuck that movie and all that. And of course I can blame it for other things too, like the perceived too dark aspects of the movie led to um Warner Brothers pulling back and then giving us campy movies and Forever and Batman and Robin. <laughs> 
So yeah, you can kind of blame Returns for that just a little bit. But yes, yeah, that's my thing on um, Batman Returns, and just to quickly cover the original Batman series. Batman Forever, I think, is a pretty good movie. Like, it has issues, like, it is too bright and over the top, and the villains are too ridiculous, and Two-Face is a complete hash in the movie. But I really like Bruce Wayne's character arc in that, which is kind of hampered because they cut out scenes which resolve that stuff. And I like, you know, the, the the relationship and the partnership they build up with Dick Grayson, and they actually do rob him pretty well. And the scene where he talks about it, and they actually do kind of, you know, justify why he was so crazy and violent in Returns. And he's saying, like, you know, you know I found the man who killed my parents, and I killed him, but then, you know, it wasn't enough. And he goes out, you know, you audience is dark, and you kill again, and you kill again. And I thought that was really well done. Val Kilmer does okay. And then Batman and Robin. We all know it's a huge pile of shit. The only thing about that movie I find even vaguely entertaining is Arnold. Because Arnold Arnold knows how to do stupid one-liners and make them sound cool. Like, he's made a career out of one-liners. So he's good at that shit. And, and I do kind of like John Glover's little cameo in it. But overall, that movie is a pile of, of wank that's just a toy commercial. And they don't even look like cool toys. Like, the Batmobile looks stupid in that movie. And they fuck up Batman and Robin's partnership that was established in Forever and just make Robin into even an even whinier asshole than he was in Forever. And he should be over that shit because, you know, he resolved his thing about his parents dying. But whatever, it, it's a pile of crap. And thank God we got the Nolan trilogy. In fact, that's the, actually, that's the best thing about Batman and Robin is that eventually, you know, it was so ridiculously camp that they pulled back and gave us the Nolan trilogy after trying to make a million different movies in between then, but I talked about that in the last Batman episode I did. But So yeah, that's really how I feel about the original Batman series in brief, and focusing on the two Tim Burton films, because that's what this one is really tied into. Now as for this script, I have to say, while there are quite a number of elements I like about it, I have to say that on the whole, like, the word to describe this Batman 2 script by Sam Hamm is just bland. And as far as Sam Hamm's other work goes, like, I haven't read too many of his screenplays, but I know a little bit about, like, I like his work on Batman. I find his, um, what I've read about his Watchmen script, it doesn't sound terribly good, and it sounds like they got really fixated on how can we change this ending and make it work, and they did something that was just really stupid. And you hear Terry Gilliam in interviews being really smug about how amazing his version of the ending was, and it fucking wasn't. And he wrote, Ham also wrote a version of Planet of the Apes, which Oliver Stone was going to direct, I believe, with Schwarzenegger in it or something. And that sounds crazy, I want to read that. But yeah, his writing on this Batman 2 script just feels really uninspired and just bland, like I said. And to start off with, and, and what's even more frustrating about that fact is that this script actually starts off pretty decently with a pretty cool action scene and I like the fact that this script seems to have a lot of fun with the Christmas thing because basically what this all this really has in common with what became Batman Returns is that the villains are Penguin and Catwoman and there's a plot to frame Batman and there's and there's a Christmas setting that's really it and I have to say that this script, though, it's just not, it's just not terribly good, but I do like the idea of a Christmas setting for Batman. I think it adds to, you know, a nice, it could provide an interesting twist on the atmosphere, because of all the snow and the cold, and even with the, and, and, you know, adding that onto the atmosphere that the 89 film had, I think that was a good choice. And that's one of the things I actually like about Returns, is the atmosphere and, and the setting. And this script actually has a lot of fun with, with the Christmas saying, because there are a number of times where they actually do make use of the snow and the, the big opening chase scene where Batman chases down these jewel robbers. They're being led by a Salvation Army Santa Claus with a machine gun. And they're on snowmobiles and the cops are getting away from, and the cops are chasing them down and they get away from the cops because there's snow in the park and the cops can't drive through the snow. And then the Batmobile comes in with, like, flames shooting out the front of it, melting the snow and chasing them down. And Batman uses uses all these different gadgets, which are really cool, like the flamethrower. And he uses these heat-seeking missiles, which are kind of cartoony, but kind of cool at the same time. And he also uses that, that hook line that shoots out from the side of it. And, and he uses that to, like, knock over some trees to block a snowmobile. And he uses it to knock one guy off a snowmobile as well. 
and then he actually um, gets a guy stuck in. He actually causes like a hole to melt in the ice on the lake that this guy that the, that the Santa Claus guy is trying to get away from him on, and he manages to take them all down non lethally and make sure they all get taken in by the cops, which I like. And another thing I like about this this opening chase scene is that it shows the cops as being relatively competent. It's just that they get stuck because of the snow, and then you know they need Batman to go in and get them. Like I like the idea that the police aren't aren't completely useless or incompetent. And I like that Batman has a fairly cl- has a fairly work good working relationship with the police in this because even though it's not quite the same thing as in the comics where he has you know the partnership with Jim Gordon. You do have Jim Gordon constantly defending Batman when the when the frame job is happening by Penguin and Catwoman. Gordon is always saying, "Well, Batman doesn't kill. He never does, even though he kills him in the first movie." But whatever, you know, this isn't really Batman's style. And even when the politicians and such are trying to go hard against Batman, he actually does kind of stand up for him, which I like. And and I feel like in Returns that kind of got lost a little bit because they set up, you know, we have the Bat Signal now. And, and you know, and you know, if you ever need my help, call me. And then he he shows up in in Gotham and he defeats all those clowns. And then he just kind of acts like an asshole towards Gordon. It's like okay, <laughs> that's that. And so as the script goes on, I'm like okay, they set up the main situation of it relatively well because, like I said, this script starts off really well. Like I, I like how it's very clearly a sequel to '89 from the beginning because. At the very beginning, they're showing people are selling Batman merchandise because everyone loves Batman because he's um because you know he saved the city and there's one guy who's actually selling authentic fragments of the Batwing, which I like because this is showing that the events of that movie had an impact on Gotham City in some way, and the fact that there's now these people who like who are like supporting the Batman and calling themselves the Order of the Bat and wanting to follow in his footsteps, I feel like that's kind of a logical thing that would happen and it's sort of a nice call back to the Dark Knight Returns where that happened. Although that actually did something with that idea where this script just kind of it's there and then it goes away. And so you have that. And another way in which this makes it this makes this quite a bit of a sequel to the eighty nine movie is that the relationship with Vicky Vale is still ongoing. And it's actually going relatively well. Now, this doesn't ever actually they don't ever really do anything interesting with it, but it is there, and I'll get to that when I talk about negatives. And then when they start introducing the villains, they introduce Penguin in a way that I actually really like. They show him getting out of prison. And one thing that's interesting is that he's called Mr. Boniface in this script. And from what I've read, that was actually his original name in the comics. And they eventually changed it to Oswald Cobblepot. And he's introduced as being in prison for robbing a certain amount of money. Like they say, it's like $40 million or something like that. And he's been there for a while, and he has, like, all these birds that he has caged up in his cell. And they talk about how he's so obsessed with birds that he's actually become something of an amateur ornithologist and written articles in in ornithological journals, which I thought that was actually really cool. And he's shown getting paroled by, um, at, at the prison, and he's saying, like, oh, he's going to lead them to where he hid the loot. And they find, it's like $42 million or something like that, and they find it, and he claims he's rehabilitated. And then you find out after he leaves that they took, they stole the $42 million, and like his his goons, his, his assistants, they like invested it, and they put it into other projects, and they made a shitload of more money. And so then they took the exact amount of money that they stole, and then hid it. <laughs> so he's made like, at least twice, even he's made like three times as much money <laughs> just by um investing it, and then he and then he you know gave them the exact amount back. I thought that was really clever, showing that he's really good with money and numbers. And then we have this thing where he's where his um his cellmate lets out all the birds, and some of them are not cold weather birds, and so they're going to die. <laughs> And then he, uh, well, what the heck does he do? Oh, crap, I gotta check my notes. He gets his revenge by, he gives him, you know, his Walkman, which also has a radio in it. And then he puts his little button when he's on his way out of the prison, which causes a specific frequency to come out of the Walkman. And it causes the birds to, like, just dive bomb him and, like, they, like, tear his face off, I think. That was actually pretty cool. Yeah, they basically, he basically gets the birds to dive bomb and kill the guy, and I'm like, Wow, that that was brutal, and I really love this version of the Penguin. He is pretty comic accurate, 
And, like, they set him up really well. And, unfortunately, the script refuses to do anything interesting with him. And you have certain things, like, that's that's probably one of the big problems with the script is that it sets up some fairly decent ideas and then really goes nowhere with them. And uh, and it also sets up, one thing I really like about the storyline of the script is that there is a sense of mystery and that you don't really know what the Penguin and Catwoman are after until relatively late in the script. So you have, so, it's, so it sets up for a very interesting mystery for Batman to solve. After all, he is a detective and solving mysteries is what detectives do. So it, so it was, it, so it was a pretty good setup for Batman to do some detective work. And he turns out to be kind of a shitty detective in this script. So yeah, you have that. And then you have, and then you have this whole idea where Vicky Vale is like crusading against homelessness, but then you know the rich, but then the rich people, including her editor, are blocking her. And there's this interesting scene where they're at dinner, and Bruce Wayne admits that Batman is not really helping with these big problems. And I thought when I was reading that that if the script went anywhere with that idea, it could actually be a pretty damn good storyline for for a superhero thing. Only it never really does. The whole displaced homeless people thing, it really only leads into introducing Dick Grayson. That's, it pretty much stops after that and has no more impact on the rest of the story. Especially since the, um, the real estate magnate, who is, you know, displacing these people so he can build new buildings, he, he's the second of the five rich people to be killed by Catwoman. So there really is no reason for him to be this. So he's the big bad guy of that subplot. So the subplot basically lacks, and he basically dies with him essentially. So there's no point to it. And I and that was something I really didn't like. Now now I'm sure there's there's plenty of things here that I could say were good. Like I do like there's a there's a chase scene through the subways that's actually not bad later on during the script, but. And there's that, and I don't mind Dick Grayson in this, even though he's not really Dick Grayson, he's just some random homeless kid. And for example, I like the third act, which is set in Wayne Manor, and the Batcave, like there's some pretty cool, you know, fight scenes and stuff there, including Batman beating the ever-loving shit out of Catwoman. <laughs> and another thing that makes this a little bit more of a sequel to 89 is that the art museum from that movie comes back, and Catwoman's actually working there, and she set up this... Egyptian exhibit, which is, you know, part of a temple of the cat goddess, Bastet, which is pretty cool. And so you have that, and then you have, um, I mean, I could say that, and there's a lot of cool stuff that Penguin does, like Penguin's pet house is, like, converted to look like a penguin exhibit at a zoo, where he's basically leaving the windows open to make it really cold and swimming around in the water, because he has, like, he has, um, he has an affinity for the cold, like, even though he doesn't like being called Penguin, he still acts kind of like a penguin, which I don't understand in the slightest. But that was a lot of fun. And you had this whole thing, I like how there was this mysterious sort of conspiracy about something called the Raven Organization, which involved the rich people in Gotham. And all I could think of with that, especially given how it plays out, is that it's sort of like the Court of Owls involving like the important people in Gotham and a bird motif, only really shitty. <laughs> And Penguin actually does some pretty cool stuff. Like, one of the death scenes of one of the members of the five families involves him controlling a bird and making it shit a bomb onto his car so that he blows up and dies. Which, that is amazing. It just, there's some cool stuff he does with the birds in this, which are just like, which are just fun, kind of Bond villainy stuff. Like, he uses some of them as like, as like transmitters or whatever. And there was some cool stuff there. Um, the, his umbrella theme isn't really featured too much, but he does have like um, a bulletproof umbrella, which I think he does shoot a bullet out of it at one point, which was pretty awesome. And, and so you have that, and and, and yeah, you have and you have that, and you have um, Batman introduces his glider here. It's described in a way that's kind of silly, but like unlike in um, in Returns. The glider, he just randomly has a glider under his cape. Here it's that he inflates his cape like a balloon, which is really kind of silly, but at least it's it's there. He does some cool Batman flying around stuff in the script. And while the whole framing Batman for murder thing isn't a device I particularly like, I, I do like how here it's actually part of the script. And that's another thing in Batman Returns where it's like, it's something that they do in the movie. 
and they completely forget about it by the end. Like, the police chase him once, and then that's the last time that's ever brought up. Here, it's actually a pervasive thing throughout the end. The police are actually pretty competent in trying to track him down and catch him. They don't succeed, but they actually make a pretty good stab at it. And the way they resolve it is pretty weak, and I'll get I'll get to that later, but but yeah, so there are, there is plenty of stuff I should I could say is worthwhile about this idea, but it just ends up becoming just bland by the end of it. And just to start off with the stuff I don't like, okay, Catwoman. Catwoman is a big thing I don't like about this script. She is just really, really annoying. She's essentially portrayed as just being a really, really horny, evil woman, and that's just about. She's evil, and she's a murderer, and that's it. Like, the only thing she really has in common with with the comic book character is that her name's Selena Kyle, she dresses like a cat, and she steals stuff. And I like the fact that she's a cat burglar in this, essentially, because that's that's a huge part of her character. But she's just obnoxious. She's constantly hitting on people and making just thinly veiled sexual remarks and stuff. And she has this weird dominatrix thing going on, which I don't know why they always want to do that. And she, where she like causes pain, where she's like hitting on this guy in the bar and she just like scratches his hands and gets all like, and gets all like kinky and stuff. I'm like, okay, why? And then there's a scene where she, where she's like semi seducing like the one guy she's going in to kill. And she's getting all violent and kinky and stuff with him and then she kills him with her claws. It's like, okay, that's uncomfortably sexual for what would have been a PG-13 movie. And she's just constantly annoying because she's always, like, making comments and stuff and always trying to hit on Bruce Wayne. And it's really hard to describe without actually reading out the dialogue to you. I just, I just got sick of her after a while and she's so annoying. And there's this scene where Batman is chasing her across the roof and, and she like, she like has him hanging off the edge and she keeps just talking to him and talking to him, and making thinly veiled sexual remarks, and going like, eh, maybe I'll let you live, uh, oh, maybe I'll cut you off, oh, I'm gonna live, and then, no, she, like, cuts the line, and then he drops off, and just barely manages to get away. And, of course, she's the one who stupidly reveals them that they're after the Raven statuettes, which they were keeping pretty well hidden, for the most part, then she just dangles it in front of them, and he figures out what they're after, and that lead, and that lead, that's what finally puts them on the right trail. And to keep going with Catwoman, they basically, this is something that also carried over into Returns, where basically they imply that Batman is completely useless whenever a sexy woman is involved. Because he sees, she sees him hanging in the shadows, but he doesn't know that she sees him. And she does like a sexy little strut and just completely distracts him. And I'm like, okay, what? Batman isn't prepared to deal with women? Like, are we seriously doing that? Granted, it's not nearly as bad as that moment in Returns where he's like, where she's fucking trying to kill him, and then he hits her once. She's like, ugh, I'm a woman, and then he completely forgets that she was trying to kill him. Like, really? There's being chivalrous, and then there's just being an idiot. And they made Batman into an idiot there, and they make him into an idiot here. And see, I don't like Catwoman at all. In fact, when Batman started beating the shit out of her, near the ending, it's like, okay, it's kind of uncomfortable that a big muscle-bound man is beating the crap out of a woman. But at the same time, this character was so annoying, I was like, I don't care. I I'm just happy to see her get the shit kicked out of her. Because she was that goddamn annoying. Eventually, she she tries to leap onto the chandelier, and then Batman cuts it down with a battering, I think. And she ends up falling onto the ground, onto into the front hall of Wayne Manor, and just like, breaking, and she's still alive, but she's basically crippled. I'm like, wow, Batman, that was shockingly violent, considering how non-lethal he is in this. So yeah, that's Catwoman for you in this script, just sexually aggressive, but annoyingly so. And her costume, by the way, is a bondage mask, because of course, childish fucking writers assume that if you wear a costume, it means you're into kinky sex. Ooh. Childish writers and really pretentious people who think that costumes are, of course, a sexual thing. But yeah, Batman's not a furry. Speaking of Batman, he's a weak point of this script, because like I said before, I like the idea that he's that he's going to solve this mystery of the Raven statuettes and what 
Batman and Catwoman are after, I mean, what Penguin and Catwoman are after, he's a shitty detective in this because he doesn't really seem to catch on to the idea that it's the five families are the ones being targeted because he never investigates that. He never tries to protect any of them. He never tries to question them after the... He should have figured this out after the second one was killed. He, he should have he should have called on to that and started questioning them. In fact, it's only by sheer happenstance that he figures out that the five families are involved because Catwoman waves the Raven statue at him, and then he gets he gets back to Wayne Manor and he's pretty badly injured. And there's at one point where he he mentions the Raven statue to Alfred, and then Alfred mentions that Thomas Wayne used to have one, but that after the funeral, one of the other members of the family showed up and asked for it, and then Alfred gave it to him. Or did Alfred give it to him, or did he, or did he steal it? He might have stolen. He might have stolen one that I can't remember. I don't care. So it's like Batman is such a shitty detective that he doesn't recognize either doesn't recognize the pattern, or he doesn't give a shit because he doesn't do anything at all to try and protect these people from getting killed. Like they, they, it just happens. Like the third guy who gets killed, Batman basically just stands on a roof across from the building and watches. And he somehow doesn't hear the fact that Catwoman is killing these guys on the roof because the guy's going to go up to his helicopter and leave because he's trying to get out of town. Catwoman, granted, she uses a silenced gun, but Batman should have fucking noticed people getting killed on the roof across from him. And yeah, there's a big neon sign in the way, but he should have he should have noticed that shit. Like he should have at least tried moving from vantage point to vantage point. And I know he can do that. I've played the Arkham games. So yeah, Batman's kind of an idiot in this script. And I kind of like the... And he doesn't really seem to catch on to the fact that Selina Kyle and Catwoman are one and the same for a little while. But when he does, yeah, there's that. Oh yeah, there's another thing I don't like about Selina Kyle in this script. Is they try to do like this weird sexual tension between her and Bruce Wayne. While still trying to preserve the relationship with Vicky Vale. And it really doesn't work. It's really annoying. And you have these scenes of Vicky getting jealous of Selina, even though Bruce isn't really all that interested in her. And Batman does get, Bruce Wayne does get kind of drugged and captured by Catwoman near the end, but it's done in a way that he wasn't expecting. So yeah, that was actually pretty neat. Now, and yeah, so Batman is pretty bad in this script. Catwoman is pretty bad. Now I'm going to save the big spoiler a bit for last, but okay, I'm going to go into um the whole poverty thing with Vicky Vale and that they introduced this idea of homeless the homeless in Gotham and how they're being displaced by these construction projects and Vicky Vale is crusading against it but her editor who is one of the um people that um that um Catwoman and Penguin are after is blocking her because he's a part of the old money thing and he's tied up in the Raven Society with the other members and it could be a potentially interesting thing to see someone like Batman go up against, because it could, you know, bring up the question of his own wealth and status as a member of the 1%, which is something which I don't think is that big of a problem with the character, but it would be an interesting place to go. But it doesn't go there. And so Vicky Vale is a character in this whom Honestly, I like the fact that they're still together, because I kind of like to see a relationship develop between characters over the course of the series, but... If they weren't really going to do anything with her, it was probably best for them to just, you know, get rid of her. <laughs> Which, that is one thing Returns does better. I, I, and I will say this on the whole, I think Returns is better than this script as just a storyline. Even though I don't like it, I think it's it's not nearly as bland as this is, ultimately. But yeah, Vicky Vale here is just completely superfluous. You can tell that Sam Hamm and anyone else who would have been on this project had no idea what to do with her. And really, she just seems like a really, you know, sideways way of introducing Robin. And it's not really that... I don't mind the way Dick Grayson is written in this script, even though he's not really Dick Grayson. He's just some homeless kid who happens to have a trapeze outfit, which becomes the Robin outfit. I don't get why he has that. It's not really explained. And this is something that's really endemic to these early Batman scripts from this period, because before 89 and after 89... All the way up until Batman Forever, they kept trying to shoehorn in Robin as hard as they could. And they generally seemed to do it in ways where they would introduce him, like, just randomly they would do... They would start introducing Robin into the third act of the script. Like, I know the Tom Mankiewicz version does that, and he uses the original circus origin 
I believe Sam Ham's one of Sam Ham's drafts for Batman eighty nine had the circus origin in the third act. And so you have this with Homeless Vigilante Robin, and then the early drafts of Batman Returns had a mechanic referred to as the kid, who would have been Marlon Wayans as Robin, and I'm like, oh god, this is just stupid. And then eventually Forever actually introduced him relatively well. It wasn't clunky, it fit with the story they were doing in the movie. But it's like, god damn, they were really trying to force Robin into this series at every possible opportunity. And so what they have here with him, it's not bad, but it's not that great because it's kind of forced in there. Like, I like seeing him help kick kick ass with Batman at the end. In Wayne Manor in the Batcave, I thought that was really cool. But other than that, it's like he's a superfluous character. Um, to get into other stuff, I'm trying, I'm going to look at my notes real quick to see if there's anything other I can get into before I get into the really big thing that sucks. Like, okay, like, I was kind of questioning why they felt the need to kill all the different members of the five families, why they couldn't just strong arm the, the raven statuettes out of them. Like, I feel like if they took the one guy's, was Provost was the guy's name who was the newspaper editor, they could have, like, I mean, they could, he wanted to leave the city. If they could have just, he could have just been like, here, take my raven statue, and he would have left perfectly fine. But I mean, the first guy they get it from, it's being transported with his stuff, because he's been out of Gotham for a while, and he's coming, his ship's coming back in with all his stuff, and he's smuggling drugs in. And so when they find the crime scene of all the people who have been killed by Catwoman, and they think Batman has done it, they find, the police find the drugs, and they bring this guy up on charges, so it's like, this guy is like, you don't need to kill him, this guy is going to be out of the way pretty soon. And then, like, okay, the second guy they killed, that's okay, and then all that... And they didn't really need to frame Batman because they do. He's such a shitty detective, and this he never would have caught on to the fact that they were stealing Raven statuettes without those really dumb conveniences in the script. So yeah, it's like I don't really get why they had to kill him. And another little thing about this I don't care for is that in Batman '89 they specifically rewrote it during production to have you know Alex Knox, you know Vicky's reporter partner, have him live because he. People, because apparently people liked him in test screenings or something, where they thought he would be a popular character and they'd like to bring him back for a sequel. You have scenes in this script which are set in the newspaper office, and he's nowhere to be seen. And I thought that kind of sucked, because I actually was a fan of his character. I thought he was a fun little supporting character. And he's one of those things where I wish they would have you know brought him into the comics in some way, because it seems like whenever there's a movie... They bring elements of the movie into the comics. Like, for a while, Batman had, like, a 89-esque suit in the comics. And they brought, they've brought brought the Tumblr into the New 52, among other things. But yeah, and for a while, the X-Men wore leather costumes in the comics. So yeah, like, I mean, I like... Oh, and in Green Arrow, they brought Diggle from the Arrow show into the comics for whatever reason. I don't know why, but... So yeah, I like when movies kind of do that, because that can be kind of interesting. Now, it can be kind of shitty, but... But no, they don't bring him back, which is kind of a waste, because I, I really like his character. But yes, there's that. And I'll, I'll just go to page through these notes. Oh yeah, there's a funny bit here where, um, because Batman's popularity is going down due to the frame-up job, he's like, you see like the shop that had Batman merch in it from the beginning? Like, all the merch is being replaced by stuff for, um, for Ninja Turtles and Simpsons, which is so meta, it's hilarious, because it's almost like those were the competing merchant merchandise things in real life at that time. <laughs> I'm like, God damn, Batman really is getting supplanted by fucking turtles. <laughs> yeah, like I said earlier, Batman gets his ass kicked. There's scenes where Batman gets his ass kicked by Catwoman way too easily, and it's like, I get you want your villain to be competent? Yeah, what is with that? Oh, also there's one thing where the guy, the last of the um guys to be left, left alive that the Penguin and Catwoman are targeting is named Tip Tree. And the police are actively, like, putting him under a protective guard and, and keeping watch over him. And I'm like, the police in this script do more to help these people than Batman does. Like, Batman doesn't seem to give a shit, really, when you think about it. Like, he doesn't really lift one finger to try and help these people. He's that bad at his job. And then there's this scene... Oh, I forgot about this. There's a scene where... where where Selina comes over to Wayne Manor because the last statuette is supposed to be there, and she's scouting the place out. And she gets in, and she stops, and she hits on Alfred, which is just uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, that's just creepy. And then, and then there's this 
just there's this kind of funny bit where they're just kind of Bruce Wayne and Selena are interacting and then you don't see how that scene ends because there's a page missing. Yeah, the hard copy that this was scanned, this script was scanned from had two pages missing, one of which you could tell nothing was really missed, but the other one is like, well, she's not there anymore. <laughs> it's like, well, we don't know how she left Wayne Manor or what she found out. Okay, I'm going to have to get into this now. I can't keep avoiding this. The big thing in this script, the big reveal, is that the Raven statuettes are meant to point the way to a, to a, they're basically meant to be part of a treasure map, essentially. There was this big theft back in the 1800s where the Gotham treasury was robbed of all this gold and silver. And then the five families showed up in Gotham, and they basically rebuilt it after this, and they made Gotham what it is today. And these include, this included the Waynes and the other four families that are mentioned. And so you find out that the treasure was hidden, and that even though it's what made them wealthy, they never used it, which is really confusing. And it was hidden, and the raven statuettes were meant to be part of the the thing that revealed where it was hidden. And then you find out that they the, the other families, they tried to get to the treasure later on, and then Thomas Wayne, who was an honest man, refused to let them use his raven statuette. And then, I couldn't believe this when it was revealed. It's revealed that the other member, the other five, the other four families of Gotham, they hired, they... I don't even want to say it. They hired Jack Napier to kill to kill the Waynes so that they could reacquire his statuette after he died because he wouldn't let them get to the treasure. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this for a number of reasons. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go with the big one first. I hate it because I don't like making the Waynes' death part of some big conspiracy, and I know Gotham, the show, was kind of building up to that when I stopped watching it. It just makes it seem less... It makes Bruce's campaign against crime seem like it's less about crime and more about this conspiracy. And I like the idea that Bruce Wayne's parents were killed by a completely random mugger, and that there was, there was no reason behind it. It was just something that happened because crime exists. And that provides the entire impetus for Batman to be Batman. Random crime killed his parents. So now he wants to keep, you know, so now he wants to crack down on crime so that that never happens to anyone ever again. Making it that it's part of this grand conspiracy just makes it feel like he became Batman for completely the wrong reasons. That there was something else that was going on and it makes him being Batman feel like it's not like it has no real basis, and I don't like it's just stupid. And okay, to make it to add to that, you find out that all of this this big scheme is that the Penguin and Catwoman are after is they're looking for buried treasure, which that's a significant come down from from Batman eighty nine, where the Joker was intent on sowing chaos and destruction, and he was going to kill everybody in Gotham with his Joker gas, and then Batman has to stop it. Here it's like, two assholes are searching after buried treasure. Why should I give a shit? Buried treasure, that's it. And then, so they take the Raven statuettes to the big model map of Gotham, which they have to plug them into in order to find out where it is. So basically it's 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 the map room, and and the Raven statuettes are the, um, the headpiece of the Staff of Ra. And so they find out that the treasure is in the caves underneath Wayne Manor. So yeah, it's in the Bat Cave. So they they, they basically they, they decide to, to go to Wayne Manor, and they Selina Kyle catches Batman. She she catches Bruce Wayne, and then they end up holding Vicky Vale and Alfred hostage, and they're trying to force him to reveal where it is, even though he doesn't know where it is. And eventually, you know, with, with Dick Grayson's help, he manages to get into the Batcave and, you know, fix the, and, you know, get rid of the drugs that she gave him with his own special pills. And so he gets up into the mansion, deals with some, deals with Penguin's thugs, and then deals with Catwoman. And then Penguin manages to make it down into the cave and figures out that Bruce Wayne is Batman. And, you know, holds Vicky hostage, and they're trying to get into the, um... And it turns out that, literally, the treasure is, like, 10, 15 feet away from where Bruce's Batcave stuff is. Like, it's literally just, like, up a bit, and then over, like, a ledge, and then there's the gold and silver. <laughs> so it's like, really, when Batman was setting up the Batcave, he never noticed that this shit was there, because he never says that it was there. <laughs> he doesn't seem to know that this treasure even existed until during the course of this movie. And... <sighs> And so there was some cool stuff with Batman and Robin teaming up, and the fight with Catwoman was awesome because it was fun seeing her get the shit kicked out of her. And then at the end, 
pretty much what happens is that the penguin is on that ledge, and then Batman and Vicky are on a catwalk. And he's like, he does something with birds or something that makes them fall off and they're hanging. And he's standing above them and they're hanging. So this thing is almost entirely lifted from, from, from the ending of the 89 movie, which is like, oh, well, that's just incredibly lazy on your part, Sam Ham. And so Penguin is like standing there gawking and then Batman does something with a gadget, which instead of, you know, tying him off and then he falls like in 89, he throws a little thing which then calls the bats from the cave and they swarm Penguin and then he falls and dies. No one knows that he's Batman since I don't think Catwoman found out that Bruce Wayne was Batman, so even though she's alive, I don't think she knows, so whatever. So yeah, the secret is maintained, but yeah, that little ending there is taken almost directly from the ending of the 89 film. It's just the setting is slightly different and the details are different. And really, that's that. And then you have this ending where Everything is like really easily, easily and conveniently tied up where Bruce Wayne says that he saw Batman fighting Penguin and Catwoman and that obviously since Catwoman has those steel claws, she's the one who killed all those people and not Batman. So Batman's name is cleared where at least that's addressed here and Batman returns. They just forget that the police were chasing Batman. And then so that really quickly and conveniently happens, and then it's quickly mentioned by Vicky. Bruce mentions that he's going to do something nice with the treasure. So that whole thing is covered, is taken care of really, really quickly. And then the whole conflict, because there's a conflict at the end where it's like, during, during the script where Batman, Bruce says he has no idea what to get Vicky for Christmas. And so he has a present for her at the end, and it's an engagement ring. And it's like, okay, so Bruce and Vicky Vale are going to get married, Bruce Wayne in a truly committed relationship. This is something weird and it's very saccharine and it ends up being a Christmas scene like like a typical sort of Christmas scene with Alfred, Vicky, Bruce and Dick just sitting around the Christmas tree You're like okay really really and oh yeah by the way Dick's presence in Wayne Manor is explained by 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 him being Vicky's nephew or cousin or something to the police so yeah there's that and yeah overall this script just well I'd say I probably think it's a better script than that crazy as hell year one script I read back in episode four. This one is just, it's just not that good. It, like I said before, it's bland. It's not interesting. The villains, they could have been decent, but the Catwoman's really annoying. I like Penguin's characterization, but once again, they never do anything with him. And his big villain scheme is searching for buried treasure. It, that's just lame. It's not interesting. It's not exciting. It's just buried treasure, and the mystery goes nowhere. The social commentary about the homeless goes nowhere. The Vicky Vale's character has nothing to do. The whole thing with there being, you know, vigilantes who are following in Batman's footsteps, that goes nowhere, and pretty much all they exist to do is to make Batman look really bad in the media because these guys are dumbasses. And yet the script is just, it's just not there, and I honestly can see why Tim Burton turned this down, because it's not a very interesting script. He was right when he said it wasn't a very interesting script, and while I disagree with a lot of his decisions on returns, he was absolutely right about it. And if this had gotten made, this would have been one of those typical middle sequel things where, because when there's trilogies, and I'm not saying it would have been a trilogy, but I'm just saying, when there's trilogies, usually one of the ways it goes is that the first one is considered to be really good, then the second one is a disappointing, set, is disappointing and kind of bland, and then the third one is either bad or it brings it back. The other pattern it goes on is that the first one is really good, the second one is even better, or the third one is either bad or pretty good. So the third one's basically the wild card. But yeah, this would have been that first type where it would have just been kind of a forgettable middle entry in the series, like kind of like Iron Man 2 is in the way. Like, this is more coherent than Iron Man 2. And just, just trying, if this would have come out, it would have gotten a, oh, well, that's not terrible, but it's not great. Basically, it exists. It would have gotten a big so what reaction if it came out, especially coming off of such a grand and exciting film as Batman 89. It would have been quickly just, it might have just killed the Batman series then and there just through sheer sort of entropy, like, like just through sheer just 
no one giving a shit. It might have just died off right there. So, who knows? I mean, honestly, I'd rather watch Batman Forever over this, too, because, I mean, that at least has more good things to it than this script does. I don't know what the heck is with Sam Hamill on this one, because he must have just been off his game. Like, he didn't know what to do with Penguin, because Penguin was... Okay, Penguin was a character that Warner Brothers insisted on using in the sequel because he was considered Batman's number two villain after... Or at least they thought he was Batman's number two villain after the Joker. I've never heard anyone say that Penguin is the second best villain in Batman history. I've never, ever heard. So yeah, he was... I guess Ham didn't really know what to do with him. And I have no idea where Ham got this conception of Catwoman from because it's stupid. Yeah, he, he fucked up Catwoman here like... He he gave he turned Catwoman into a weird kinky bondage woman long before Frank Miller's year one script, which was just Catwoman, bondage, dominatrix. Yay, that was her entire character in that script. Honestly, I liked her better in that than I did in this, because at least she got to do cool stuff and wasn't annoying throughout it. Yeah, this is it's not technically as just bonkers nuts as Miller's year one script was, but this was it was just horribly bland to read and it's not very impressive. So yeah, this was not a very Merry Christmas Christmas themed script for me to do. But yeah, I don't know what else to say, guys. Um, Batman 2 by Sam Hamm, it's probably for the best that this didn't get made because the series probably would have just gone out with a whimper if this happened. And yeah, I'm glad. I, I, this would be a boring movie to watch. It just would. So yeah, guys, that's, I suppose that's it for Batman 2. I'll come back next month with something else, hopefully with a co-host, and hopefully it'll be better. But yeah, guys, until next time, goodbye and Merry Christmas, or Happy Holidays, whatever, whichever you prefer. Goodbye.